Hello everybody, um, so this is the final uh, lecture to help you get prepared for the final test for the research and analytical skills module. Obviously, thanks to our dear little virus friend, we are going to be doing this test online on the KLE. I'm using the tests function on the KLE. It's the, the same test as we've always done, um, but just all, all online. You've got two hours to do it rather than one hour. Um, and some other sort of guidance and, and things will, will come out and I've already put some announcements out about that. Um, what I want to achieve um, going through this, this short lecture here then is first of all to identify the key themes on the module. See what bits of the module we're going to be testing in the multiple choice test and what bits we're not going to test. And I can also give you some hints of which bits are going to be a big feature of that multiple choice test and which bits are going to be a very small feature or not at all feature. Okay. Another thing to talk about is how can we apply um, a statistics to a multiple choice framework? Because that's quite counterintuitive. Um, but hopefully by the end of this session, you'll see how you could be presented with an experimental scenario and a mini tab output. And you could then see how we would write multiple choice questions so you could uh, cope with and answer those, those questions. So what we've been doing is we've been going through the module. We've started off after a sort of lecture talking about the design of experiments in the first place. Spent some time looking at descriptive statistics. Modes, medians, means, spread about the mean like variance and standard deviation, standard error of the mean. Distributions like the normal and the Poisson distribution and graphing our data. This is all sort of describing the data. We then move to inferential statistics where we're testing different types of hypotheses. Maybe you're wanting to see if there's any difference between two means, any difference in more than two means, any difference in um, me means across different factors. Um, we could have got interactions between two factors to affect a mean rate of a response variable. These are all tests of difference. We've looked at tests of um, relationship we've looked at um, tests on categorical data so we're, we're looking to see um, are two categories related in any way observed and expected values the data transformation lecture um, is not going to feature too heavily in the exam to the next slide I've color coded things for you which can hopefully make things a little bit easier so in red which is from summary statistics down to categorical data analysis, this is all definitely going to be in the, the final test. This is a large part of what you've been doing on this module. It's not all stats, it's research skills, so it's ethics and sustainability and presenting your research as featured as well. Um, but really the bulk of the module has been about processing your data. Um, because we want you to be ready for collecting data and analysing data and, and analysing other people's data analysis when you come to your final year projects next year. So these red coloured themes here are things to revise in a lot of detail. Experimental design, presenting research, bioethics, less um, less important. They're going to be a little bit in the, a little you know, minority of questions in the test, but not a lot. Data transformation, that lecture, although very important, is not really going to feature in the final test. You should have an awareness of data transformation, what data transformation can do for you, an awareness of some of the really common transforms, the log, log 10 natural log transforms, why you might use those. But things like you're not going to get questions like ArcSign transform this data. Or, you know, what does the box cox transformation do? That, that, that type of thing. Um, the data transformation lecture was there to prepare you for next year when you're going to get real but messy data that's not lovely contrived data such as you've been working on, which fits all the assumptions of the tests we want you to learn about. As for the choosing the correct statistical test lecture, well, that's sort of right at the heart of a lot of the questions in the final test. Um, so there'll be lots of questions that rely on your knowledge that you can pull out of your statistical toolbox the right statistical tool for the experimental design you've been given. Can you use that tool appropriately? Can you check the assumptions of that statistical test? Can you draw conclusions from that statistical test? Really, you know, that's right at the heart of, of what this, this exam, this final test is going to be. 
mainly then statistics. So the test format, it's all multiple choice questions, 50 of them, no negative marking, um, which we get asked every year. You're not going to lose a mark if you get one wrong. There is only one correct answer. So if you think there's two answers that are appropriate, you're barking up the wrong tree. Um, you will need calculators for some questions. Um, there's going to be a little bit of basic arithmetic going on for, for a minority of, of questions. Um, so have a calculator to hand. I mean, traditionally, when this was done on paper, um, then in, in the exam hall, then students would need to bring a calculator with them, would advise. Um, when we're going to be doing this at home, on our laptops, um, it's going to be, uh, you know, we're probably going to be able to have a calculator much more easily to hand. So, a fascinating slide there showing us the anatomy of a multiple choice question and what, how utterly pointless that is. Let's just think, though, how to approach a multiple choice question. Because sometimes, if you can answer a multiple choice question without looking at the answers, it can be quite useful. So here we can see a question which we can try and answer without even seeing the answers. If I've got five options showing below there, I can start to, you know, get my, my sort of gut feeling that it's that it's one option can start to be swayed by thinking, you know, I've got some doubts coming in. Or is it is it B? I thought it, I think it's C, but is it B? I'm not sure. So if we haven't got the, the answers available for us to see, um, it can be quite useful. So here we can see a nice question here that we can hopefully answer without even seeing the options. And then once we think we know the answer, we can see is our answer in the options. And if it is, great, that's good fun. We can then tick it and or we, you know, we say that's the right answer and off we go. So the mean weight of males and females in a class is compared. Weight is a quantitative continuous variable. How would you classify the other variables? don't need to see the five options here we can answer this okay this is about can you you know do can you remember the different types of variable because knowing what variable you've got is the first step on that statistics choosing chart isn't it? it's the first step in knowing which tool to pull out of the box if you've got categorical data there's no point reaching for anovers there's no point trying to do a regression if you've got categorical data, if you've got counts, how many boys, how many girls, how many smokers, how many non-smokers, you've got, it's going to almost certainly be a chi-squared analysis. You're going to lose information if you say, well, the median number of boys was this, the median number of girls was that. That's going to be an inferior an analysis to trying to see if there is an association between the number of boys that smoke, the number of girls that smoke, etc., etc., etc. Okay, so knowing what variable you've got is one of the first really most important steps in choosing the right statistical test. That's why it's the first question on the stats report. It's saying to you, look at all these variables that we've measured on these flea, these, these bird fleas, and look at all those variables and say, which one is quantitative continuous, which one is, is quantitative um, interval, which is categorical, which is ordinal. Um, so, we're, trying, we're getting you to do this here. So weight is quantitative continuous. The other variable is male or female. So it's categories, isn't it? It's a category. And there's only two categories. So we've either got poly, polyatomous categories, where we've got many categories, maybe blood groups, blood group A, blood group B, A, B, O. We've got four categories in there. Here we've only got two categories, males or females. So it's quantitative, so it's categorical, sorry, dichotomous. That's the answer we want to see in the options. Let's flip in hope that categorical dichotomous is in the option. Hurrah! It is. There we go. And that's obviously the correct answer. Sometimes then you need to see the options in order to answer the question in the first place. Which of the following, but we can't see them yet, is not a measure of dispersion around a central tendency? Whew. We need to see the options before we can answer that. But before we sort of glance down and look at the options, let's just think of the two key terms here. Central tendency and dispersion. Those are the two key things there. What do we mean by central tendency? Well, averages. It's, you know, what is the roughly the middle, middle-ish value in the data? But we don't really use average now, do we? On this, we, we, we would say the mean, the median, the mode. So that's the central tendency. Dispersion is simply how the data is spread around that mean, median or mode. So it's standard deviation, variance, 95% confidence interval, standard error about a mean. It's interquartile range, 
about a um, or range about a median, or it could be you know well the, the mode is the most common value, so it doesn't really so much tend to have a dispersion around it. So there's the option standard error of the mean. Well, that is a measure of dispersion around a central tendency. We've got the mean and the standard error is the dispersion. Modal value. There's, there's what we think is the answer. We're looking for one of these that is not a measure of dispersion. Option A, standard error of the mean, is a measure of dispersion around a central tendency. Modal value is a measure of central tendency. So that's the one we think is the wrong, is the right answer because it's not a measure of dispersion. Variance, well, that's just the square of the standard deviation. Interquartile range is the spread about a median. Standard deviation, square root of the variance. So we're confident then that B is the modal that B is the right answer. The modal value is not a measure of dispersion around a central tendency. Okay. So next, we'll look at C then, how we can apply this multiple choice framework to a mini tab output. You're going to be expect lots of questions where you'll be told, here's an experimental design, here's part of the mini tab output, and there might be four or five questions on that experimental design and mini tab output. Okay. So experimental design and it's a really charming one and um, we're looking at how rats carcasses are colonized by maggots over time so we've got two variables days since death and the number of maggots so we can straight away then think well what have we you know what which is going to be our response and which is our predictor or dependent and independent variable so if you wanted to you could just press pause and have a quick think about what is the response and the predictor variable or you can just carry on and we'll realize that the number of maggots is the response to is going to change with the days since death we don't then get from the sort of you know the eighth day of maggots to the 24th day of maggots or anything like that we're thinking that the number of maggots on that decaying rat carcass is dependent on time and the time since the death of the rat. Truly charming research this. In that, you know, we've got a slope that's not significantly different from zero. I was pointing at the screen with my finger then, how utterly pointless that is. The slope here, um, B, is not significantly different from zero. So it's more or less parallel to the x-axis. The R squared is just on the floor. It's tiny, it's useless. And the regression equation up there does not describe a significant amount of the variability. We've got a truly awful regression model. Why? What's gone wrong? The diagnostics. Um, what advice would we give about this analysis then? We'd look at the diagnostics and we'd see, well, we've got non-normal... Um, the, the summary, the, the, the number of maggots is not normally distributed in the first place. Um, the residuals look, mm, crumbs, there's something really weird going on with the residuals. When we plot the residuals against the days since death, what we're looking for is no real pattern here. And clearly, there's a pattern. There's a, you know, the, the, the pattern is that we've got a non-linear relationship um, with those residuals. So there's something really rather important going on here. Um, the residuals themselves are not normally distributed, so we've got a problem there. And the sample size is quite small, so we've got a problem. And of course, as, we're, as we've already had a clue given to us by the residuals against X plot, we can see that the problem is that we're trying to fit a single straight line to describe a curvy linear relationship. Okay? So there is that straight line that's not significantly different from zero. Look, it's more or less parallel to the x-axis, so for any value of x, we're getting values of y just in between here predicted but those are the actual values of y obviously this is emphasizing to us that one of the hugely important assumptions of bivariate linear regression is that there is a linear a single straight line relationship between x and y this is why it's so important when we're doing a bivariate linear regression the first thing we do is we eyeball the data just plot it scatter plot look at it x and y if we'd have done that with this analysis we'd have seen plotting number of maggots against days since death we'd have seen well there's no point doing a bivariate linear regression here we need to do something else. okay and what we need to do is a quadratic regression okay so look now how the regression equation has changed y equals a plus b x mi <clears throat> minus um, b2 x squared 
Okay, so we've now got a quadratic term put into that regression as well. R squared has absolutely flown up. Look, um, so we've got 97.7% of the variability in the number of maggots is described by variability in days since death. The null hypothesis that this regression model here does not describe a significant amount of the variability, we reject the p-values way less than 0 0.001. Remember, lots of you have been writing in your stats report that p equals zero. It's not the case. p is a probability. It runs from zero, which is an impossible event, to one, which is a certain event. Just because Minitab is not showing, showing you that that's zero at three decimal places, it might even still be zero at 16 decimal places. We never would report that p is zero. P is, we can just write here, p is less than 0 0.001. Um, any lower than that, we're, we're not too fast. It's a highly significant result, that's what we would say. And I can see then that the linear term here and the quadratic term are both, um, well, the, the linear term is not significantly different from zero, the quadratic term is, okay? Y equals A plus B1 times X plus B2 times X squared. Um, that's just there, that's Minitab, a rather older version of Minitab here. Can't do superscript two, that's why we've got times times two. It's just that Minitab's way of showing us x squared. Okay. So yeah, I hope that's, you know, we, we've gone from giving you a regression output so that and not getting you to answer a multiple choice question on it. And then we've critiqued that regression output and we've come up with a much better model. Okay. Let's look at another experimental scenario. Then we're wanting to measure the hematocrit, um, the red blood cell um, amount in a mountain animal at increasing altitude. So again, we could just think, right, what's the independent variable and what's the dependent variable here? Dependent variable or the, the response, the independent variable or the predictor. Um, so again, you can just press pause, take a little think for a minute and think which way around those two variables are. Um, of course, what we've got is the hematocrit is going to be the response and the increasing altitude the predictor okay so we can think about um, which is the dependent and independent variable and we can then think are these suitable for regression or correlation or could we do both on them is it reasonable to think that the hematocrit of this mountain goat is in some way dependent on the altitude changing altitude is that going to change the hematocrit and of course we can think, well, yeah, there's a mechanism that lies behind that. Sometimes we can get two related variables, two variables with a very high correlation coefficient, um, telling us that they're quite strongly related, but it's absurd to try and get use one to predict the other because we've got no obvious mechanism um, that, that we can we can put between them. Things like, you know, we the, um, in the, the lecture that I used to give on this, we, we went onto a website called Spurious Correlations, um, I think there's still a link to it on the on the KLE page, and you can just put in all sorts of random variables like the um, you know the per capita um, margarine consumption in, in some state in the United States, and that same state's divorce rate. And we see that there's a really high correlation between the margarine consumption and the divorce rate. But we wouldn't then want to be saying to somebody, well, well how much margarine do you consume? Oh, you take a lot. Oh, dear, your, your, um, you know, your marriage isn't in a very good situation then, is it? It would be absurd to think that there's a mechanism that, that one explains the other. So we wouldn't regress those. But in this situation, regression would suit trying to explain the relationship between an increasing altitude and um, hematocrit in a mountain. So if we then did this analysis, we see the Pearson's R, we've got a negative correlation um, that's highly significant, minus 0.897, so that's a strong negative correlation. P is 0.008, um, so we can see it's highly significant. Let's just think about then P a minute, because we've been harvesting P values all over the place. And I said a moment ago that P is a probability, and it runs from zero, an impossible event, which could be, you know, if I've got one fair six-sided dice, um, die, dice, dice, and I roll my six-sided dice once, the probability of getting a seven is zero. I'm not going to get a seven from a six-sided dice, assuming each, you know, it's one, two, three, four, five, six on those sides of the, the, sides of the dice. Um, 
the probability of getting a number between one and six is one. Okay, so uh, it, that's why it's so important that those of you in stats reports that are putting p is zero, you know, that that's not the case. We must understand that p can't be zero. It can be a very vanishingly small probability, um, but not zero. So you've been getting p values all over the place. So let's just think what p actually means, because a lot of people really misunderstand this. And one of the really common misunderstandings about a p value is that the p value is that there is a probability of 0 0.008 that the null hypothesis is true. Okay? You can see this even in published research. You know, or people putting it a slightly different way, saying, well, there's a probability of 0 0.008 that the findings were due to chance alone. And that's, that's wrong, because the p-value is computed assuming the null hypothesis is true. So how can you then work out a probability that something's true that you're assuming is true in the first place? Okay, The, the sort of corollary of... If we're assuming the null hypothesis is true, that there is no relationship between, in this case, hematocrit and increasing altitude, then it follows that any relationship that we've got must be due to chance alone. So we can't have a probability of 0 0.08 that the findings were due to chance alone. So we can see these two options here, they're both one and the same thing, really. Um, another sort of um, mistake that some people make sometimes is to think, well, there's a probability of 0 0.008 of getting the same results again if we repeat the experiment. This is not what P is at all. Statisticians can compute something called P rep, which is exactly this third option here, the probability of getting the same results again if the experiment is repeated. But that's P rep, which is rarely used. Um, we're interested in P here. So P does not mean any of these things. These are some really common fallacies around the p-value and you don't have to read that far in published scientific research to see especially this middle one people thinking that there's it's the probability that the uh, that the findings that they've got were due to chance and that is just not the case at all what the p-value is is it's the probability of getting the results you got or more extreme if the null hypothesis is true Okay, so what that means in this context is it's the probability of getting an R of minus 0.897 or lower. In other words, closer to minus 1. That's the, the limit of the negative correlation. So it's the probability of getting an R of minus 0.897 or, or lower if the null hypothesis is true. Okay, So the probability of getting that R value or lower is a really small probability. Because you, so we can see in here there is the inherent assumption that the null hypothesis must be true. So it cannot be either of these first two. The probability that the null hypothesis is true, we're assuming it's true in the first place. It's the probability of getting the results that we got. Okay. Sometimes this p-value fallacy can become really uh, rather important and kind of have some quite you know significant knock-on consequences for you guys it's really important to just know what p actually is it's a probability and what is it a probability of okay you'll see some general you know we can go through a few general questions as well which of the following is not an assumption of a two sample t test um we've got four options there you could think well you know which of those don't matter too much in a two in a two sample t test the one that's jumping out straight away is the residuals we look at the residuals as important sort of diagnostics in ANOVA and in regression. Not really important in a t-test. We need both samples to be normally distributed. We need to know if the variances are equal or not because we can do an equal variances t-test or we can do Welch's variances, Welch's sorry, t-test with unequal variances. Um, but we need really to, to skew, you know, we need to choose the right t-test depending on what, what, um, our variances are. Similar sample sizes are quite important in a two sample t test as well um, because that evokes the power. If I've then got, um, you know, wanting to see the difference in test scores between males and females in a class and I've got 30 males and five females, then when I come to compute the power of that two sample t test, obviously the number, I'm, the sample size I'm going to be chucking into the power calculations is of course the um, the smaller sample size. Okay. Um, 
Uh, the, you're not going to get this sort of question, but it's just one to get you thinking. You know, an odd one out questions are, are, are awful, so we're not not going to give you one of those. Um, which of these is the odd one out? Why? Um, you can have a quick think about that. Man Whitney, Krushgal, Wallace, Spearman's or Wilcoxon. So one of those is the odd one out. And we can try and think why is that? Um, what's leaping out straight away? They're all non-parametrics, aren't they? Um, they're all tests that use ranks. Wilcoxon signed ranks and Spearman's ranks, obviously. Man Whitney works on ranks. Um, and Krushgal Wallace is an extension of Man Whitney, so it's still using ranks. So everything's connected by ranks there. So you can keep thinking, well, why? What is what is um, odd one out here? Wilcoxon, that's for paired data. Man Whitney isn't. But Krushgal Wallace, well, you know, you, you couldn't really, doesn't, doesn't really, paired thing doesn't fit in. And with Spearman's rank, we're looking at relationships between two separate variables. So the whole paired thing doesn't work. If we go back to the choosing chart, um, we think, well, Man Whitney, Krushka, Wallace, and Wilcoxon are all up at that top end of the of the top half of the choosing chart where it's tests of difference. Man Whitney, Krushka, Wallace, and Wilcoxon are all tests of difference, whereas Spearman is a test of relationship. So there we've got our odd one out, as I would see it. I um, mean, you could then say other other reasons about you know other, other other possible reasons but that's the one i was thinking of needless to say odd one out questions are far too ambiguous um, and there's there's too many potentially correct answers so that that, that wouldn't this you wouldn't see this sort of test in in the, the final test uh, three differences between parametric and non-parametric data just to get you get you thinking again well what what makes data parametric well first of all it all has to start with our variable types, doesn't it? Just like you did question one of the stats report, you've got, um, you were asked what different variables you've got. I think that's a great starting point for you with any analysis is to ask yourself, what type of variable have I got? Because you can see with that choosing chart, what type of variable you've got sets is that, you know, the very first step in saying, well, which part of the choosing chart do I go to? Um, if I've got categorical data. If I've counted something, maybe, you know, I've got number of the dominant phenotype, number of the recessive phenotype, or I've got the number of male smokers, the number of male non-smokers, number of female smokers, female non-smokers, etc. If I've counted things, then I'm going to be going down into that bottom left-hand corner of the choosing chart, which is categorical data analysis. I might be building two by two tables. Um, it's chi-squares, isn't it? Or maybe, you know, Fisher's exact tests and it's it's Kramer's V and Mantle, Hansel, Cochrane tests for multiple tables and things. So knowing your variable types is really important. And that can then be an important way. If you, you know, if we know, for example, if, if we've got ordinal data, if we know we've got ranks, if we can see something's been recorded as maybe the first bird that came to a bird feeder at sunrise, the second bird species that came to a bird feeder at sunrise, the third bird species that came to a bird feeder at sunrise. Then I've got ranked data. And straight away, though, so if I've got counts or ranks, I know immediately that I'm dealing with non-parametric data um, so that you know there's another question in the stats report that was wanting you to do a non-parametric analysis and the clue was really in the question um, because you know knew you were being asked to do an analysis on a variable that you'd already sort of um, classified as, as, as accounts um, and, and you're also being asked to test medians as well which is an, another big clue um, so Three differences then well, is the variable type, first of all. If I've got quantitative continuous or quantitative interval with large, you know, um, you know large, large intervals, then I'm more likely to be parametric data if that data is normally distributed and if that data has equality of variances. Okay, so some equality of variances can be a tricky one because in some modern statistical in statistical packages like Minitab, we can adjust the t-test to take into account unequal variances. So we can do Welch's t-test. There's also Welch's ANOVA. You can adjust a one-way ANOVA um, to be to, to account for um, unequal variances, um, and then we do a different um, a different post hoc test whose name escapes me right now. 
Holmesidac, I think, is the, the non-parametric post hoc test. But anyway, that doesn't matter. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the variance is thing. Sometimes if it's like with a two-way ANOVA with interaction and you've not got unequal variances, that's disastrous. Um, but with a t-test with a one-way ANOVA, we can we can adjust sometimes. So those three differences then is the variable type most notably. Normality, equality of variances are the, the three things I would be thinking of. Okay. So I hope that's been useful. Key themes on the module, go back to that slide where I've color coded everything um, to say what is definitely in the test, what there'll be a little bit of in the test and what you don't need to worry about too much. I hope you can see, especially with using that regression question, how you could then get a mini tab output and deal with it in a multiple choice question framework. There's already some practice questions up on the KLE for you to have a go at as well. And I'm hoping to be able to get some more data sets uploaded for you where you can have a little play. I'll give you the experimental design, I'll give you the real data, and then you can just start having a bit of a play with it. And then I'll upload a screencast of my analysis of that data um, later on. Don't forget you've got the Titanic data set, which you can have a fantastic play with. It's obviously a huge data set. I think James has been talking about that in the earlier lectures on the module. And there's some fantastic analyses you can do with that. Just playing with the data. Now you know all these statistical tests. You've got your statistical toolbox. It's full. We're not going to tell you any more now, but you could start having a go at using these statistical tools to just test some hypotheses about the Titanic data. I've got one video, which I think quite a few of you have seen, which is doing a binary logistic regression, trying to um, see the probability of surviving the sinking of the Titanic based on which class you're in first, second or third class, whether you were male or female, and how old you were. And it is fascinating, absolutely fascinating. You wouldn't want to be an old male passenger in third class on the Titanic. There's a tip for you if ever you find yourself on a, a Biden voyage of a steamship in the 1920s. Um, last bit of advice I'd give you based on what a lot of students do in the, um, when we did the paper versions of this end test, Lots of students would, I think the first thing they'd do once the invigilator say you can turn your papers over now, lots of students would seem to just then write down that choosing chart straight away. Um, and I have a copy of the choosing chart. So, and that's telling me that people use that a lot, um, which is good because that's what it's there for. So I think for you guys doing this test, have a copy of the choosing chart in front of you and use it and make sure you really know your way around it. And use the choosing chart when you're playing with data, like the Titanic data and the other data sets that I upload. You could even go and revisit the stats report data set. Maybe do some other analyses on the on some of the data in the stats report. There's a whole lot of other patterns in there and things that the stats report hasn't teased out um, that you could do. But you'll learn well by just playing. You've got Minitab all going on your machines. Minitab have been fantastically supportive for us and they've extended licenses and, and things so that you can have Minitab on your home machines. But by playing with the data and getting used to all the different functions in Minitab and what the outputs mean and use the help menu in Minitab to find out more about all these outputs, you'll just become better data analysts. And that's what you need in order to be a good scientist. Stay safe, all of you. Um, and crikey, I hope we'll uh, see you all in September. <laughs>